Learning is a voyage that takes you to a metaphysical journey. It allows us to visualize and in a way, experience phenomena that we otherwise wouldn't have. Greetings of peace and prosperity to everyone. I am Teacher Jordan Salvador Hepana, and today I have the great honor of helping you learn something that is arguably relatable to any human being. Are you all ready? Let's go then! Today, the point of our discussion is the cell structure. In studying this, it is inevitable that we also look at the complexity and the functions of each parts and organelles that are within the cell. By definition, a cell is the smallest unit that is capable of performing life functions. In this context, all living things must contain and be comprised of cells in order for them to be able to perform life functions. This is actually the establishing tenet that is discussed in the cell theory. Alongside this, the cell theory has two more postulates. This include, cells are the smallest working units of all living things, and all cells come from pre-existing cells through cell division. While most reference materials acknowledge that there are three tenets in the cell theory, modern scientific literature add three additional postulates to these three. These are energy flow occurs within cells, hereditary information is passed within cell to cell, and all cells have the same basic chemical composition. The cell theory lays down the fundamental rules that we need to know regarding cells. These rules allow us to understand the mechanism by which cells function with, while providing human beings a wide array of practical applications from predicting life expectancy to the creation of medicines and vaccines. Here are examples of cells. These examples come from a wide variety of organisms, with the ability of carrying out a varied range of function, while also having different levels of complexity. We have amoeba proteus, plant stem, bacteria, nerve cell, and the red blood cell. Generally, there are two or two types of cells. Every living organism has a cellular structure that will dictate their placement between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The main difference of these two types of cell is the presence of nucleus. While eukaryotic cells have nucleus, prokaryotic cells lack one. Prokaryotes also have the remarkable characteristic of not having any membrane-bound organelle. It is noticeable how less complex prokaryotic cells are in comparison to eukaryotic cells. This is brought about by the fact that they have fewer internal structures and each one of these structures do the same amount of work that three or four organelles carry out in the eukaryotic cells. These type of cells are found in all one-celled organisms and in some types of bacteria. On the other hand, eukaryotic cells have a higher level of complexity and are therefore capable of more intricate processes. This is the reason why most living organisms have evolved into having eukaryotic cells as they are more adept in ensuring the survival of organisms. Plant and animal cells are exceptional examples of eukaryotes. They are highly detailed and are adapted to performing highly individualized processes that contribute to the proliferation of life. We have here a typical animal cell. It is rounded in nature with its individual parts and organelles scattered inside of the cell. We also have a diagram of the plant cell. Due to the presence of a cell wall, plant cells are rectangular in nature. Different references will give you different answers regarding the number of parts a cell would have. The most common answer would be three, an enumeration of the nucleus, cell membrane, and the cytoplasm between them. Other reference materials would say eight. These include cell membrane, nucleus, mitochondria, chloroplast, vacuoles, plasmids, cell wall, and ribosomes. For our purposes of having a simplified lesson, we will divide the parts of the cell into two categories depending on the location of the functioning organelles within and on the cell. These classifications are surrounding the cell and inside the cell. Before delving into these parts, it is necessary that we hearken back to what we have been told when we were studying as high schoolers. Cells and its parts have always been likened to a city or a township. This is because the functions of different organelles bear a striking resemblance to necessary services in our communities such as messengers, waste facilities, and power plants. There are two organelles that fall under the category of organelles found surrounding the cell. 
The first one is the cell membrane. The cell membrane is what we would consider to be the security of the cell. This is an outer membrane that regulates and controls the entry and exit of different molecules in and out of the cells. It achieves such function because of the double layer of lipid that line the membrane. This is composed of two different types of lipid layers, one hydrophilic and one hydrophobic, that makes the membrane semi-permeable. Exclusive to plant cells, we also have the cell wall. These protective organelles are made of cellulose, a material that is indigestible by the human digestive system. Cell walls provide plant cells with turgor pressure, a force that allows plant cells to have a secure and stable structural integrity despite the constant passage of materials particularly in plant cells that are responsible for plant nutrient transport. Inside the cell, most organelles perform highly complex tasks. The nucleus, what we would consider the government and executive branch in the cell, is the center of all the activities within the cells. This is made possible by the fact that the nucleus produces enzymes that are necessary to initiate every metabolic process that occur within the cell. It also houses the majority of genetic material within the cell. We also have the nuclear membrane, a highly specialized membrane that functions almost the same as the way the cell membrane functions, only this time it guards for the nucleus. The genetic materials that we spoke of earlier are what we call the DNA. These DNA combine together to form the chromosomes that are within the nucleus. These are responsible for the transfer of traits from a parent to an offspring. Alongside these chromosomes is the nucleolus. The nucleolus is responsible for the production of the protein that is required for the translation of genetic material. We also have the cytoplasm, a very significant part of the cell. The cytoplasm is gel-like in nature. This is because this provides the cushion for the organelles and parts within the cells that protect them despite the fact that cells are always rubbing against one another. The endoplasmic reticulum is the largest membrane-bound organelle inside the cell. This can be likened to a manufacturing plant in the community. This comparison can be made because the endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for protein synthesis, lipid processing, the storage and release of calcium molecules within the cells. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum, the rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Their only difference is that the rough endoplasmic reticulum is embedded with ribosomes while the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is not. Speaking of ribosomes, we will now discuss them. These small, bead-like organelles have two main functions. These include its role in the decoding, translation and transportation of genetic material by forming peptide bonds. Arguably the most popular part of the cell, the mitochondria is the power plant of the cell. This is because it is responsible for the production of cellular energy by breaking down fats and carbohydrates. Up next is the is the messenger of the cell, the Golgi bodies. They are considered as such because of their role in packaging nutrients that circulate within the cell and the waste materials that are needed to be transported out of the cell. With regards to waste material and dead cell parts, we have the lysosome. This organelle does the recycle and waste collecting within the cell by using the digestive enzyme that is contained within the lysosome. The last two organelles that we need to discuss are almost only exclusive to plant cells. The vacuoles serve as a site for storage, digestion, and waste disposal. It helps secure the structure of the plant cells. Lastly we have the chloroplast. They contain the green chlorophyll, a pigment that allows for the collection of sunlight for photosynthesis. While they are found in plant cells, there are instances that we call kleptoplasty. This is an instance when an animal steals chloroplast from the plants that they feed on, allowing them to photosynthesize. The leaf sheep, a sea slug that can be found in the Philippines has this ability. The following reference materials are used in this presentation. We will also be discussing the ground rules for metabolism. In order for us to understand what this entails, here is an overview on why the cell is an optimal site for metabolism. 
The first one is that the living cell is a miniature chemical factory where thousands of reactions occur. The second one is that the cell extracts energy and applies energy to perform work. Lastly, some organisms even convert energy to light, as in bioluminescence. These core concepts serves as the foundation of how metabolism occur within the cell. Speaking of bioluminescence, this byproduct of metabolic processes has proven itself to be incredibly beneficial in the field of medicine. One such benefit is how bioluminescence can be used to help track down the effectiveness of different antibiotics on different types of bacteria. The first ground rule that metabolism needs in order for the process to flourish is that there must be an active transformation of matter and energy. However, these transformations must be anchored in the laws of thermodynamics. Technically speaking, metabolism is the totality of chemical reactions that occur within the cell of an organism. This is vastly different to what people associate metabolism with, which is the act of digestion and absorption of nutrients. While this conception is also a part of metabolic processes, metabolism as a whole is more than that. This is a process that is a necessity in order for life to continue its proliferation and involves all sorts of interaction that are occurring within the cell and among the cells. As a result, this process is a highly organized affair that requires a strict adherence to the chemistry of life. Metabolic pathways rely on the production of certain molecules that are derived from other specific molecules. These reactions are mediated and initiated with the help of certain enzymes. The figure shows how a starting molecule will be induced into a reaction when a specific enzyme gets in contact with it. This process repeats itself until such time that the desired product is produced. There are two categories of metabolism, catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is the set of metabolic processes that break down large molecules. These more complex molecules are broken down to produce energy necessary for various functions of the body. The energy is utilized for building or anabolic processes. On the other hand, anabolism is the process by which the body utilizes the energy released by catabolism to synthesize complex molecules. These complex molecules are then utilized to form cellular structures that are formed from small and simple precursors that act as building blocks. These processes are studied extensively in bioenergetics, a field of scientific study that aims to explain the mechanism of energy resources management in every living organism. In understanding this, we must familiarize ourselves with the term energy and what it means in a molecular level. In this context, energy is the overall capability of a living body to exact a change in any shape, way, or form. This can exist in different forms. These energy forms include kinetic energy, the energy in motion, heat or thermal energy, a product of the random movement of matter in an atomic or molecular level, potential energy, the possible amount of change an organism can derive considering its structure and location, and chemical energy, the potential energy that can be released in a chemical reaction. Looking at the diagram, it is shown that all living organisms, human beings on this instance, have innate potential energy, its level depending on the location or position, any action that will be undertaken converts this potential energy to kinetic energy. These energy transformations are what thermodynamics aim to study. As what was stated earlier, metabolism is highly dependent on the laws of thermodynamics. As such, it is necessary to figure out whether the energy transformations we are talking about occur in a closed or an open system. In the case of living organisms, thermodynamics say that living organisms are open systems. What does this mean? In order to find out, we must study what the laws of thermodynamics say. The first law of thermodynamics say that despite the fact that transfer and transformation of energy is possible, it being created nor destroyed is highly unlikely. This is referred to as the principle of conservation of energy. In this context, the overall amount of energy in the universe is constant. It may change forms and be transferred but its level will not change. On the other hand, the second law of thermodynamics emphasizes on the fact that during an energy transfer or transformation, 
some of the energy will be rendered unusable by the body and thus, escapes as heat energy. In this sense, the more energy is transferred or transformed, the more heat will be produced. This is clearly evident in the set of photos here. The first photo illustrates the first law of thermodynamics with the fish being the source of chemical energy that the bear can later transform to other forms of energy. The second photo shows that during the process of respiration, a process that requires utilization of energy, the bear releases heat, a manifestation of unusable energy in the bear's body. Order and disorder has a lot to do with these processes. It has been proposed that evolution has been directly influenced by metabolic processes. As a result, organisms have evolved to have structures with greater order than what their ancestors used to have. However, the reverse of this is also true. One example of such change is the evolution of mobility in snakes. Bronze ago, early ancestors of snakes walk with legs. The changes in time has led to them being what they are today, consuming less energy than what they usually had. This process is a reflection of how energy is cycled through the ecosystem. All energy begins in the form of light and ends up as thermal energy. Another interesting case is the case of the cactus. Due to their environment, they have developed a simpler structure that is at the same time operating on much more complex processes to maintain life despite their ecological situation. With that said, entropy or the disorder in the universe, mostly in the form of thermal energy continues to rise despite organisms' adaptation to lessen the entropy in their system. Spontaneous reactions release free energy as they proceed. Recall that the determining factors for spontaneity of a reaction are the enthalpy and entropy changes that occur for the system. The free energy change of a reaction is a mathematical combination of the enthalpy change and the entropy change. These calculations allow biologists to determine the spontaneity of a reaction. Following this, free energy change can only be observed when work is done. In the case of living organisms, particularly in the cells, this only happens when there is a balance in temperature and pressure. Fortunately, this is the case in our cells most of the time. Energy in the cells is a very complex matter. There are many classifications that are in need of consideration. Such are exergonic and endergonic reactions. Exergonic and endergonic reactions share similarities and differences. The most known definitions of exergonic and endergonic reactions is exergonic refers to a reaction that gives off energy, while endergonic reactions take in energy. Equilibrium is a state where everything is balanced. The chemical reactions of metabolism are reversible, and they, too, would reach equilibrium if they occurred in the isolation of a test tube. Because systems at equilibrium are at a minimum of G and can do no work, a cell that has reached metabolic equilibrium is dead. A cell in our body is not in equilibrium. Given this illustration of an isolated hydroelectric system, it can be assumed that no work will be done after the system reaches its equilibrium. Our cells can be likened to open hydroelectric system that has a continuous stream and is never in equilibrium. As we have said, continuous work is what metabolic processes entail for our cells. This occurs because of the cellular energy that is the ATP. ATP combines the process of giving off and taking in energy in order to do work. These work may be chemical, transportative, or mechanical in nature. Without ATP, no work will ever be done inside the cell. Adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, is the primary carrier of energy in cells. The structure of ATP is a nucleoside triphosphate, consisting of a nitrogenous base adenine, a ribose sugar, and three serially bonded phosphate groups. ATP is commonly referred to as the energy currency of the cell, as it provides readily releasable energy in the bond between the second and third phosphate groups. ATP captures chemical energy obtained from the breakdown of food molecules and releases it to fuel other cellular processes. It does so during the hydrolysis of ATP. During hydrolysis, ATP reacts with water. This will result in the detachment of one inorganic phosphate, adenosine diphosphate, and a release of energy. Comprehensively, 
ATP hydrolysis is the catabolic reaction process by which chemical energy that has been stored in the high-energy phosphoanhydride bonds in adenosine triphosphate is released by splitting these bonds, for example in muscles, by producing work in the form of mechanical energy. Given that this is a cyclical process, ATP is considered to be a renewable energy source. In the process of regeneration of ATP, creatine phosphate transfers a high-energy phosphate to ADP. The products of this reaction are ATP and creatine. Metabolic processes also rely on enzymes. Some enzymes help to break down large nutrient molecules, such as proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, into smaller molecules. Each enzyme is able to promote only one type of chemical reaction. These chemical reactions are metabolic processes in itself. The figure shows how sucrose is broken down into glucose and another simple sugar called fructose. This process is aided by an enzyme that is specifically designed for this process, the sucrase. The activation barrier is the sum of the energy that must be expended to get the reaction going. An activation barrier is often pictured as a hill the reactants must climb over during the reaction. Once, there, it can slide down the other side of the hill to become products. Enzymes allow activation energies to be lowered. They lower the activation energy necessary to transform a reactant into a product. In the enzyme-catalyzed reaction, an enzyme will bind to a reactant and facilitate its transformation into a product. Consequently, an enzyme-catalyzed reaction pathway has a smaller energy barrier to overcome before the reaction can proceed. The enzyme, S active site binds to the substrate. Increasing the temperature generally increases the rate of a reaction, but dramatic changes in temperature and pH can denature an enzyme, thereby abolishing its action as a catalyst. The induced fit model states an substrate binds to an active site and both change shape slightly, creating an ideal fit for catalysis. When an enzyme binds its substrate it forms an enzyme-substrate complex. Enzymes promote chemical reactions by bringing substrates together in an optimal orientation, thus creating an ideal chemical environment for the reaction to occur. The enzyme will always return to its original state at the completion of the reaction. Although some enzymes consist only of protein, many are complex proteins, this may include the fact that some of them have a protein component and a so-called cofactor. The cofactor may aid in the catalytic function of an enzyme, as do metals and prosthetic groups, or take part in the enzymatic reaction, as do coenzymes. Enzyme inhibitors are molecules that interact with enzymes, temporary or permanent, in some way and reduce the rate of an enzyme-catalyzed reaction or prevent enzymes to work in a normal manner. The important types of inhibitors are competitive, non-competitive, and incompetitive inhibitors. The photo illustrates the how substrates usually bun to the active site of the enzyme. This however, is shown to be compromised during competitive and non-competitive inhibition. This leads to the fact that there is a need for the strict regulation of metabolic pathways. The cell does this by regulating the genetic materials that function as the primary encoders of enzymes. Allosteric regulation refers to the process for modulating the activity of a protein by the binding of a ligand, called an effector, to a site topographically distinct from the site of the protein, called the active site, in which the activity characterizing the protein is carried out, whether catalytic, in the case of enzymes, or binding, in the case of receptors, in nature. Allosteric inhibitors modify the active site of the enzyme so that substrate binding is reduced or prevented. In contrast, allosteric activators modify the active site of the enzyme so that the affinity for the substrate increases. Feedback inhibition is a cellular control mechanism in which an enzyme's activity is inhibited by the enzyme's end product. This mechanism allows cells to regulate how much of an enzyme's end product is produced. Given the complexity of the metabolic processes within the cell, there is so much that we still need to know. Most of the bulk of the metabolic processes are going to be discussed on how cells expedite energy. The following are the reference materials used to prepare this presentation.
While we may not be learning at an optimal pace, the thing we need to remember the most is that effort and hard work pays off. I hope that you learned something from today's discussion and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me online via www.facebook.com slash average loser. Don't forget to follow existing health protocols, stay safe and happy learning. Sir Jordan Salvador Hepana, signing off.